My name is Chris Hewer, and um, for about the last 30, 35 years, I have been studying Islam and running programs to help people to understand about Islam. So I run a whole program called Understanding Islam and Christian-Muslim Relations. And for about 15 of those years, I was based here on this campus in what used to be the Selyuk Colleges, where we had a center for the study of Islam and Christian-Muslim relations. Um, so we used to have the center here for the study of Islam and Christian-Muslim relations, in which we used to have Christian and Muslim teachers, Christian and Muslim students, and Christian and Muslim governance. This was founded in 1976, and uh, it closed down in the early part of this century. Um, and some of its work has now been taken on by the university, but most of that has closed down too. So um, this used to be the College of the Ascension. This was one of the two Anglican colleges here on the campus. And there were loads of other colleges spreading all over that way to, to the Bristol Road and then beyond. So that's where I'm coming from. I have been asked to divide the day into two parts. So this morning we're going to look at understanding Islam and this afternoon we're going to look at understanding Christianity. So approximately two three hour sessions with lunch in between. And um, let me just give you an idea where we're going. So this is my website and one of the things that I do now because I am gloriously called peripatetic. This means a vagrant who just wanders around from place to place. So as part of my work, what I do is to run this website on which I am loading materials so people can access that material. It's all free, it's all downloadable. Um, one thing that you can find there, if you are a newcomer to understanding Islam, there's a document called Short Guide to Understanding Islam. And if you're the long course kind of person, there's a 46 part course on understanding Islam, each part comprising of a half hour video talk plus an article that goes with it. And it's in four sections. So you will get to understand how I think it's helpful to teach people about Islam if you have a look at this material here and get a look at it. This short guide was taken up by one of the big mosques in London and they produced um, a full glossy edition of it so they could hand it out to visitors coming to the mosque because they said it, uh, it explains our faith rather well. And this 46 part course grew out of a half hour talk every week on the Ahlal Bayt TV channel, which is a, a Muslim TV channel. And I say that just to say that it can't have been all rubbish, otherwise they wouldn't have kept me going for 46 weeks. Great. So that's who I am. This is what I've been asked to do. I've been asked to look at five questions, and all I've done is to rearrange them a little bit. Now the X this morning stands for Islam, and this afternoon stands for Christianity. So how did X begin? What are the core beliefs of X? What is X? What are the main divisions within X? And what are the similarities and differences within X? So that's the excitement of the day. Now how much of that we will actually do is another question entirely. Because uh, there's enough there to keep us going for 30 hours, not just for three. So what we will do is precisely what you want to do. In other words, this is your day, this is not my day. So the whole idea of these days is that you get from it what you want, and you do that by asking questions. If anything isn't clear, you want to follow something up further, whatever, then you ask questions. If you don't ask questions, the punishment is I keep talking. <laughs> and I promise you I can do it. So please don't wait for polite pauses, just jump in and ask questions. And I won't be at all put off if you do that. Human beings are questioners. That's one of our uniquenesses. If we don't question, we're not human. 
believe it or not. Great. So we're going to look first of all then at Islam and we're going to ask the question, how does Islam come about? And the first thing to say is that if we think that Islam comes about from the time of the Prophet Muhammad, born in the year 570, dies in 632, and the revelation that was given to him in the Quran, we have now fundamentally misunderstood Islam. Because never do we say that Muhammad is the only prophet sent by God, but always that he's the last prophet. Now, if you are the last, there must have been something that went before. The Quran does not talk about one prophet. It talks by name about 25 prophets, one of whom is Muhammad. So if we just begin with Muhammad, we have lost the plot. We don't understand what Islam is about. The Quran tells us on one occasion that you do not know how many prophets have been sent. To all the peoples of the earth, guidance has been given. Therefore, we are breaking out of any narrow understanding of what Islam is about. Islam is not the religion of a bunch of people called Muslims. Islam is that natural way of life, which is the way that God created the world, the way that God wants it to be, which has been reinforced again and again and again through all the peoples of the earth, throughout all centuries, through thousands of prophets that have been sent to the earth, and through hundreds and hundreds of books of revelation that have been sent to the earth. So, expanding our understanding then of Islam. Now, 25 prophets mentioned by name in the Quran, 21 of them are biblical characters. So, fasting from the beginning, Adam, Noah, Enoch, Lot, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Ishmael, Joseph, Jonah, Job, Moses, Aaron, David, um, Suleiman, Solomon, uh, uh, Solomon uh, Elijah, Elisha, Ezekiel, Zechariah, John, as the Christians say, John the Baptist, and Jesus. Now, these 21 biblical figures are all mentioned in the Quran as earlier prophets sent by God. So what the Quran gives us is a starting point, Adam, and an end point, Muhammad. And then in between, we have all the centuries of humankind up until the time of Prophet Muhammad. And we have all the peoples of humankind. So Islam is in no sense a tribal religion. It's not the religion of the Arabs or any other peoples on earth. Important to remember, only about 15, 15% of Muslims on earth are Arabs. 85% are not. Um, it's, Could I just yeah. ask, um, between Jesus yeah. and Muhammad, are there other prophets that those of us from a Christian background wouldn't recognize, well, recognize wouldn't be familiar with? Um, Muhammad says on one occasion that uh, the last prophet before me was Jesus. Right. So Jesus, penultimate prophet, Muhammad, mm -hmm. ultimate mm -hmm. prophet. Um, and that certainly would be true in what we could call that, that biblical Hebrew Semitic family. Mm -hmm. Now, Muhammad says on one occasion, 124,000 prophets have been sent to the earth. Now, if you know 25 out of 124,000, you have 123,975 vacancies. So there are vastly more that we don't know than those that we do know. So it could well be that other biblical prophets, mm -hmm. Isaiah, Jeremiah, whatever, were also prophets sent by God. We just don't know. It could also be that other great religious leaders of earlier times 
um, uh, were prophets sent by God. So at times in India, for example, the scholars asked, uh, could the Buddha have been an earlier prophet sent by God, or Confucius, or Zoroaster? These are all possibilities. And you answer the question by saying, look at the teaching of Muhammad, look at the teaching of these people, and compare the two. To the extent that they agree, you can build up probabilities. To the extent that they disagree, then you have less likely. You can never be sure, because the principle is, if it says it in the Quran, you have to believe it. But you can make a scholarly argument. So in the times of Muslim rule in India, for example, uh, the scholars said, on the balance of probabilities, it may well have been the Buddha was an earlier prophet sent to the people of India. Therefore, we have to give him the benefit of the doubt. Similarly, to all the peoples of the earth, guidance has been given. So when in the Mughal rule in India, they saw people following the Vedas, the scholars examined the Vedas, and they said, you know what? On the balance of probabilities, this might well have been what's left from the earlier revelation sent to the people of India. And so, on precaution, we say, yeah, they might well have been people of an earlier revelation. As long as you don't have a prophet after Muhammad, you can make a case. As long as you don't have a revelation after the Quran, you can make a case. But he is the last prophet, the Quran is the last revelation. So you have the beginning, you have the end, and what comes in between is open. Thanks very much for the question. Proves it can be done. Okay? So, um, now, crucially then, Islam is teaching there is only one God. There is only one being worthy of worship. Now this one and only God is not a tribal God, doesn't belong to one people of the earth, doesn't belong to one religion. It belongs to humankind. Therefore, what kind of a being is God? Well, the Quran speaks about the justice of God. God is just. Now it would be fundamentally unjust if I only revealed guidance on human living to part of humankind. That would be fundamentally unjust. Therefore, we have a principle of continuity. So from Adam to Muhammad, you have a constant or perennial cycle of revelations which are guiding different peoples of the earth how to live the human project. Now, this again breaks us out of all our narrow concepts. For example, if we just take a very, you know, a very simple example, there is no such thing as Islamic code of dress. How could you imagine a Muslim Eskimo dressing the same way as a Muslim from sub-Saharan Africa? Yeah? At the end of day one, both will be dead. Or at least one of them would be. There are Islamic principles, then, which are interpreted in different cultures, at different times, in different places, but the principles remain the same. Because the principles are guidance for human beings on how to live a fully human life. So constantly, we've got to be subjecting our thinking. To what extent is that cultural? And to what extent is that according to the principles of Islam? So I could take you to parts of Birmingham where people will tell you point blank, unless you speak Urdu, you're not a Muslim. Oh no? Yeah. I mean, Prophet Muhammad didn't speak Urdu, so assuming, well, that's another question. Okay? Or, unless you dress in shalwa kameez, you've lost your faith. It's nonsense. You know, you go. You go across to Bengal, never heard of Shalwar Kameez. Huh? Or go down to Hyderabad, never heard of Shalwar Kameez. These are 
the cultural dress of North Indian peoples. So constantly we have to be subjecting our interpretation. What are the principles and guidance to humankind and how are they exemplified in different cultures? Now, Islam is a, is a vastly world interpretation. So, yes, Muhammad is the last prophet, the Quran is the last revelation, Muhammad is the universal prophet, there will be no more after him. The Quran is the universal guidance. So it is the last edition of the perennial guidance that has been sent again and again and again to humankind. Abraham was a prophet of God, sent with guidance, sent with the scripture. Moses, sent with the scripture. Jesus, sent with the scripture. All clear in the Quran. Now, God would be fundamentally unjust to send Moses with a defective scripture. Couldn't be. So therefore, we have to say that the essence of all the revelations that were sent, when they were sent, was the same. So anything that's gone wrong has gone wrong after the time of the prophet by the people who have said that they are following that prophet. In other words, you've got to blame the human beings, not God. Because God would be fundamentally unjust if God sent defective revelation or sent revelation to a lying prophet. Unthinkable. Yes, sir? Yeah, the way I see it, I mean, all these prophets were sent to different nations, different countries and all that, so that as a guidance. Yes. Yeah? And the scriptures and all that. So that then people can't say, oh, we did not receive guidance. Okay? That's the justice of God. Now, the way I see it, as far as Quran is concerned, it affirmed the previous prophets and the previous books as guidance. It did not reject it. Now, the way I think why different scriptures and different times and all that, maybe to suit the, the, the way people understood or behaved and all that. Okay, for example, uh, during when the Quran was revealed, it was, you know, the time of writing poetry and all that, you know, people were very educated and so on. So, to suit that, the Quran was revealed. Okay, but as you say, I mean, it's one religion. Now, whether you call it Islam from uh, Adam to, to Prophet Muhammad or any other religion, but there is a common element, I agree to that. And uh, we all should unite based on that, okay? Now, you mentioned about Buddha, whether Buddha was, was a prophet. There's one theory that Buddha was Prophet Kizer. Now, I don't know how far it's true, but mm. it's a theory. Mm. And uh, about India, maybe even Ram, Lakshman, and all that, they were also prophets. Because as you said, we don't have mm. a few names mm. mentioned in the Quran, not many. So, the problem is, as you said, is not understanding or misunderstanding that uh, we tend to, you know, think that whatever we are practicing is, is true and others are wrong and things of the sort. Although it's a true religion, one religion, you know, from, from Adam to, to Prophet. And we should unite based on that, mm. rather than us unnecessarily being divided mm -hmm. and killing each other, which Islam yeah. does not, or any religion does not approve of. Uh, I absolutely agree. There's a, a, another dimension to it, because the Quran says that it comes to confirm the earlier revelations and to correct where they have gone astray. So that we also have to accept that earlier revelations were 100% on message, but over centuries things have gone astray. Therefore, the Quran comes to correct as well as confirm. And um, 
the thing about the Quran is that God actually says in the Quran, I have learnt that the people of the earlier revelations could not be trusted to preserve them without error, without anything happening to them. Therefore, I, God, will protect this revelation for all time. I will protect it from error and I will protect it from loss. So, yes, we have an understanding of many revelations sent to many prophets, but the last and definitive edition is the Quran, so that if something disagrees with the Quran, by definition it's wrong. So there is the element of correction there as well. And uniting around, the difficulty with talk of uniting around, people say to me, you know, I know a Muslim, I know what Islam is about. I say, nonsense. You know one Muslim, yeah? You know one, one millionth of what Islam is about. Because Islam itself is hugely diverse. There are only two things around which every Muslim unites, and that is the Shahada. There is no God but God. Muhammad is the messenger of God. After that, there's diversity. So our idea then of uniting around depends around what? If you say that you're worshipping something else other than God, then we have a problem. Uh, if you say that if you are a Muslim and you say that, well, there's another prophet after Muhammad, we've got a problem. Or if you say Muhammad wasn't really a prophet, didn't exist, you have a problem. So it's always the problem is around what are you uniting? And if you want to say that some human beings were created by God for eternal damnation and never had a chance of getting into heaven, we have a problem because you've tribalized God. So what we can unite around is always an issue. If we go back to our non-starting point for a moment, which is Prophet Muhammad, we, we learn essential things about Islam from him. Number one, he receives revelation from God. 610, month of Ramadan he receives revelation from God. So revelation is in no sense made up by Muhammad. Authorship lies with God. He receives the guidance which is to be collected and written down in the Quran. Now, that makes the Quran the word of God in the most literal meaning of that saying. And it means that this becomes what we can call an Islamic theology of revelation. So Moses receives a revelation sent down by God. Jesus receives a revelation sent down by God. So does David, so does Abraham, and however many else we don't know. So a crucial thing then when we're coming to understanding from one faith to another is that every time we use a technical term like revelation or like prophet, then we have to say, what do you mean by that? Because when a Christian uses the term revelation, they mean something very different from what a Muslim means. There is no doctrine of tanzil or wahi within the Christian tradition. In the same way, if you look at the biblical religions, when they talk of prophets, they mean something very different from what Islam means. Because when Islam talks of a prophet, a prophet is a human being of the highest possible spiritual excellence, who is preserved from sin by God, and therefore is infallible, who receives guidance from God and perfectly puts it into practice and is therefore a living example for human beings on how to live a godly way of life. Now that's a Muslim definition of a prophet. A biblical definition of a prophet is very different.
Please, sir. Yeah, I was just looking at uh, the belief and all that. Say Hindu, they believe that God has to had to come to this world in order to guide us how to lead a perfect life. Okay. Now the concept of Muslim God is everywhere; He can't be seen, and things of that sort. So, and God is much more nearer to us, all of us, than our jugular vein. Yep. Okay. So the attempt should be how to be near to the God, how to reach God, and all that. The other thing, what I feel we need to uh, visit each other. For example, I could go to the church, and I've got three churches where I live, blessing of God, and. Uh, the, the Christians should should visit our center, you know, and we need a dialogue, exchange of ideas and all that. Not criticism, okay, we believe whatever we believe, whatever happens, but just to have a proper understanding. And that's why I admire you and I admire such uh, uh, seminars or conferences, which makes us, you know, to understand and appreciate each other's belief mm. without condemning or criticizing. Mm. And that teaches us humility. You see, one of the crucial things is that human beings always are prone to arrogance. And our arrogance, in effect, says, I will tell God what God is like. Yeah? Me and God, I know exactly what God thinks. Me and God down the pub last night, we understand exactly. This is human arrogance. So difference is there in order to promote humility and to promote an understanding that God is God and we are not God. So we often want to talk about God as though God were somewhere. Well, if you are a being of pure spirit, you are not anywhere. So there is nowhere that God is. And there is nowhere that God is not because God is not limited by space. So you cannot say, I've got God, hmm? because God is everywhere and God is nowhere, because God is not limited by where, by space. In exactly the same way, God is not limited by time. So there never was a time when God did not exist. There never will be a time when God ceases to exist because God is not limited by time. So God is not incredibly old, <laughs> nor is God incredibly young, because young and old have no relevance to God. God is outside of time. So from our human perspective, we can say, I was born, I did this 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. If we're looking at that from God's perspective, every one of those events is now, because there is no time with God. Now this becomes crucially important then, that when we talk about remembering something, or we commemorate something, we make it present we enter into God's time. So, those who are accustomed to commemorating the uh, events of Karbala, the day of Ashura, for example, we are not thinking what it was like then, we are reliving that experience now. It is a present reality. From a Christian perspective, you could say, you know, Jesus was not born then, Jesus is born now. Because it's a present reality. Everything is present with God. So what we call the past, what we call the future, do not exist in God's time. Everything is present. That's why God knows what we call the future. Where, um, Christians would commemorate any particular, particular occasions where they're reliving Jesus, mm. Jesus would Easter be one of them? Mm. It would be. I mean, you could start with 
every week. See, why do Christians gather for worship on Sundays especially? Because originally they were Jews. They kept the Jewish Sabbath. Sunday was the first working day of the week. If you wanted to meet on the Christian day, the day of the resurrection of Jesus, when he rises from the dead to eternal life, that was a Sunday. So every Sunday you are commemorating, making real, making present that act. And then as you go through the year, you can see that at Christmas they commemorate birth, um, they commemorate different elements of his teaching during the year of his life, and then ultimately they commemorate his death, Good Friday, just before Easter Sunday, and then on Easter Sunday they commemorate his resurrection to eternal life. So just in the same way, you know, when we think about um, Leilat al-Qadr, for example, we are remembering the first night of the re revelation of the Quran to Muhammad. It's as though it were this moment when we think about the birthday of the Prophet. It's as though he is born at this moment, because in God's perspective, that's how it is. Yes, sir. Yeah, with regards to Jesus' crucifixion, uh, Quran says that it it made to appear. Yeah. And he was not crucified yeah. as such. He was raised by God. Yeah. And he resides in the fourth sky. Yeah. And he will reappear with a descendant, one of the descendants of the prophet. Yeah. With, and then will establish peace, justice, and tranquility in this world. This is one of the fundamental differences between Christianity and Islam that the Quran says that he was neither crucified nor killed. It appeared to them as though he was, and he was taken up from them. That means that in his second coming, it will be, as it were, to resume that one and only earthly life, at the end of which he will die. That will be his one and only death. Then at the general resurrection, Jesus and everybody else will be raised from the dead. That will be his one and only resurrection. So it's a difference there, a fundamental difference between Christianity and Islam. I have a question. Yes, please. When we read books about introduction to Islam, they always say that Islam begins with Prophet Muhammad or Islam is a young religion. Does yeah. it mean that they are wrong to say that? Yes. Simple answer. Yes, they're wrong. And that, but they, nearly all the books say that. Yeah. You go along to the mosque and they will give you the same story. And what they're doing is distorting the picture, you see. So if you imagine reading a crime thriller, mm -hmm. but you open it at the last chapter, you get to know who done it, but you've no idea what the plot is. That's the problem. Yeah. So... Yes, we can say Muhammad is born 570, 6th century in Arabia and so on. Therefore, that's a short time ago by comparison with Moses or Abraham or Jesus, whatever. But if we want theologically to understand the way Islam sees things, we fundamentally misunderstood. That's the problem. And that's what our children are learning in school. That's what the books are saying. And that's what a lot of our Muslim teachers are saying in the, in the mosque. Uh, and therefore, fundamentally misunderstanding. Yes, sir? Yeah, I agree with you in the sense that, as you mentioned earlier, that Islam developed from uh, uh, Prophet Adam and ended to Prophet Muhammad. So it developed gradually as, as society developed and uh, customs, traditions develop and all that, so that it made sense to those mm -hmm. people of the time. And why Quran is in Arabic? Because the people at that time knew Arabic. Mm -hmm. If they knew English, it would have been revealed in English mm -hmm. or Hebrew or whatever the language, like mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Bible mm -hmm. was, was revealed. Now, the other thing that the Muslim believe is that uh, the Muslim consider Jesus to be a grand prophet, mm. okay? And 
according to his word, he had to go so that somebody should appear. Mm -hmm. That is the prophet. He prophesied that the prophet will come. Because he said that uh, there are lots of things uh, for me to tell you, but you not you know, understand. So he was waiting for coming of another prophet. Mm -hmm. And that was Prophet Muhammad. Mm. And as you said, that uh, unfortunately, the previous scriptures were not preserved. Mm -hmm. I think they were written in parchment or two. Mm. And uh, we are at a loss not knowing it. Mm. Okay. So our effort should be to read and understand as much as we can. Okay. Because Quran has been uh, written down and all that. Now, having said that, the important thing is that the Muslims should appreciate other religion also. Like me, I'm very much interested in religion mm. and languages. Mm. So I studied all the religion, but Bible and all mm. this. And several copies of Quran, the translation, mm -hmm. because uh, no, no two translations are similar. That, and then talking to people and all that. The other thing I noticed that when I talk to very educated people, they can understand my viewpoint mm -hmm. and my questions. But if you talk to not so educated, they would uh, get, you know, uh, angry or mm. tell me off and things of that sort. So, so we should. I mean, th th that's why we need to unite. And we can only unite if we understand each other and appreciate each other. Yes, I, I, I agree. Um, the crucial thing when we come, though, to your, your principle of gradualism is a very important one. Because the Quran itself is revealed over a period of 22 years. And it comes down in bite-sized pieces. So five or eight verses is a typical amount of the revelation of the Quran. Now, if it's coming down over a period of 22 years, if you do not understand the context into which it comes, then you cannot understand the revelation that you have before you. So, for example, the first 12 years, the Muslim community are living as a tiny persecuted minority in the city of Mecca, in amidst a people who are idol worshippers. Never more than about 300 people are Muslims during this period, and they are living under persecution. Now, that obviously colours that's the context into which verses of Quran come. During the last 10 years, the context is completely changed. So during these 10 years, we have a settled community and the Quran is laying down, as it were, long-term guidance. Now, if you don't know the context into which it comes, you cannot understand it. Why this is so important is that we have vast amounts of people alive today who are precisely misunderstanding Islam because they are taking verses of the Quran out of their context and they are taking them thinking that one verse is all there is to say. If you read the Quran, you know that a bit here, a bit there, a bit somewhere else, it's a developing gradual picture. If you just take one piece of teaching in isolation, you are bound to distort it. Now, in the same way that we find non-Muslim people, whether they be journalists or politicians or whoever they may be, also will take one line of the Quran. This is the word of God. That's what the Quran says. That must be what Muslims believe and what Muslims do. So this whole idea of gradual revelation is crucial. Uh, if you, just to take one example, if you ask, what does the Quran teach about alcohol? Well, there are three verses in the Quran about alcohol. One says, do not come to your prayers when you're drunk, go home and sober up first. The second one says, there are good things in alcohol and there are bad. If only you knew it, the bad outweigh the good, keep clear. And the third one says all alcohol is forbidden. Now you do not know what is the teaching of the Quran on alcohol. And you can see then the temptation to say, well, I like a drink, I'll take the first one. Yeah, I won't come to my prayers when I'm drunk. So you've got to go back into the context 
The first one is revealed at a time in Mecca when there was idol worship. People were getting drunk as part of their religious practice. Don't come to your prayers when you're drunk. The second one is revealed after the community moves to Medina. The context is now completely changed. It's a moral exhortation. There are good things, there are bad things. If only you knew, go for the good. And then the third one is when the Quran is laying down long-term guidance. All alcohol is forbidden. Now, how is that verse to be understood? First, you have the context. Secondly, you need to ask, how did Muhammad understand it? How did he put it into practice? What did they do? He said, bring out all your wineskins, slash them open, pour the wine into the ditch. Get rid of it. Now you know what is the teaching of the Quran on alcohol. It's forbidden. Now, but only if you know that sort of context can you begin to unpack what the Quran is talking about. So therefore, teaching about Quran, understanding Quran, has to be a contextual study. And that was the context then in 7th century. Now, in case you hadn't noticed, we do not live in the 7th century Arabia anymore. We're living in Britain instead. Therefore, we then have to take that teaching of the Quran and apply it to this society today and say, how do we apply that teaching of the Quran to this society today in order to achieve the same outcome? So you could take the alcohol, take it one step further. What about drugs? The Quran says nothing about what we would call narcotics, drugs. So we have to ask, well, what do they do? Well, they have the same impact, the same effect that alcohol has. It destroys your inner being. Physically, it destroys you. It destroys you intellectually, spiritually. It makes you do things that you ought not to do. It makes you do things that you get out of control. Drugs, alcohol, same effect. Therefore, both forbidden. And if you come up with another substance, then we'll do the same sort of intellectual argument. So part of this is to work out how we are to apply that message given to that prophet at that time today. And that then is the challenge of making this truly universal. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just want to add something. Uh, as Muslims, we are supposed to have belief in all the prophets, mm -hmm. whether on the 24th or what do I do, and all the four holy books, yes. including the one that was uh, revealed to the Jesus. Yes. Unfortunately, we don't have the, the, it in a written form mm -hmm. so that we can really rely, as you said, it has been distorted all time and all that. So as a Muslim, you have to have this belief. Without this belief, we are not Muslims. Yep. Okay. Anybody else want to come in? Please. Question about yes. Arabic. I thought yeah. Arabic is a language from God and it came down first through the Quran. Well, um, if you're going to think that, then um, you are limiting God to wandering around in heaven, whatever that means, communicating in Arabic, which is an earthly language. And then you have to say, well then, how come that when God sent down revelation to Moses, it was in Hebrew? Or to Jesus in Aramaic? Or to whoever the Chinese prophet was, in Chinese? And whoever the Eskimo prophet was, in Eskimo? Uh, and so on. So these are earthly languages. So what we have then is, God who is above all this, outside of all this, beyond all this, speaking. Now, he is speaking the word. The word is what we would call in philosophy the effective cause. It makes stuff happen. So we're told that when God creates the world, God says, be, and it is. So 
God creates through the word. The Quran talks about Mary being made pregnant with Jesus and Angel Gabriel says, this is not a problem for God. All God has to say is, be, you're pregnant. So it's through this word. The word is an effective cause. And it is that effective cause then, which is revealed in the scriptures, in earthly languages. Now, if you had sent a scripture to Muhammad in English, he would have been a useless prophet because he couldn't have read it or understood it. It has to be sent in the language of whoever the prophet is who receives it. And whatever community. So again, if you want to ask, that word is really difficult in Arabic. How do we really understand what it means? Well, the first thing you have to do is go back and say, the people who lived alongside Muhammad in that place, at that time, in that culture, how did they use that word? How did they understand it? Because that's, God is speaking in that language at that time, not in any other language at another time. So the Arabic is the language in which the Quran is revealed to Muhammad. But Arabic in this sense is not, as it were, the language of heaven. Because, well, when we get to heaven, wait and see. Just one sec. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, if, you're, if there is no so-called heavenly language, then how would you tie in the Christian concept of speaking in tongues? Uh, this... Sorry. Oh, sorry. I said that... Because um, Dr. Chris was just talking about how there wasn't a so-called heavenly language. How could you tie, uh, tie in the Christian concept of speaking in tongues? Cause that's the case. When Christians talk about people speaking in tongues, they're not saying this is a heavenly language that they're speaking. What they're saying is one of two things, because you have always variety. In one case, it might be that these are sounds which bubble up from the, the, the depth of the human being, from the heart, from the spirit or whatever. They do not necessarily have meaning, but they are a way of the depth of the human being expressing the praises of God. Another possibility is that this is a way in which God is sending a piece of inspired guidance to a community through one person. And this one person then speaks. And in this case, the words do have a certain meaning. It's as though it were a language. But it's not a language that I, the speaker, understand. But you, the hearer, you may be able to understand it. So you've got a double action going on. So it's a way of God guiding a community, as it were, through two people. The receiver who speaks and the hearer who interprets. So you have these two things going on. Please. If we believe that Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was the last prophet. Yep. Where do Sufis stand? Sufis will believe that Muhammad is the last prophet, but he is not the last of purified beings who are deeply spiritual, who are there to guide other people in um, a spiritual ascent to God. So what is a prophet? A prophet is one who receives revelation from God, is sinless and is infallible, perfectly puts it into practice. That's different. Now, in the Shia tradition, that's different from an imam. Imams, yes, are masoom. They are sinless, they are infallible, but they do not receive new revelation from God. They have inspired ilham, inspired guidance on that. So prophet, imam, different. Sufi peer or Sufi teacher, sheikh, 
master, mistress, whatever you want to call them, different again. They are not sinless. They are not infallible. But they, through a combination of God's gift and their training, uh, have become purified, growing ever closer in a relationship with God and helping other people who follow them. This is the concept of tarika, tarika, those who follow, um, uh, that they should follow in that way in self-purification and closeness to God. But if any Sufi says, my Sufi teacher is a prophet, they've just left the fold of Islam. And if any Shia Sufi says, my Sheikh is the Imam, well, you better smarten yourself up because you're saying that Imam al-Mahdi has returned amongst us. So, you know, steady on now, lads. There were only 12 Imams within the 12 Shia system. The Ismailis, the Seveners have different systems. But there's no reason why God cannot work with human beings through the purified soul of the human being. See, prophets are not superhuman. They're not angels. They are like us 100% in every way. Therefore, the individual is capable of making that same spiritual ascent to God that the prophets themselves made. Maybe not at the same rate, maybe not to the same height, but there is not essentially a difference. Um, we know, for example, that um, during the early period, Prophet Muhammad is awoken one night by the angel and is taken on a mysterious journey from Mecca to Jerusalem. From Jerusalem, he ascends into heaven and has an encounter with God. Now, in this, he learns stuff that only God can teach. We call this the knowledge of the unseen. Now, each one of us human beings is, as it were, on that same journey. Now, we may be going, you know, on a snail instead of a winged beast. So we may be very slowly going on that journey, but there is nothing essentially about Muhammad that is not true of every human being because he is fundamentally human. He is the perfect human being, but he's human. If you deny the humanity of Muhammad, you've just left the fold of Islam. And that's a problem because some of our Sufis, of course, get very close to that. You know, where they say that, oh, Muhammad wasn't really a human being. He was a being of light. He didn't eat food like the rest of us. This is problematic. This is problematic. Because once you deny him his humanity, then he's no longer any use to us as a role model. Yes, sir? Yeah, what I wanted to add, uh, as far as Quran, which was uh, revealed in Arabic, it should, it did make and should have made sense to the Arabs during that time for them to accept it. Although there are some verses which are not clear. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing is, uh, for example, uh, on the question of, you know, the custom, the Arab custom was, they used to bury their daughters alive. Yes, sir. And God, through Quran, prohibited this. So there's a lot that a person can learn from the reading the Quran and the teaching of the Prophet. Mm. We, have, we have different sources, and this becomes very important. So our primary source is the Quran itself. Now, you have got the text. How you interpret the text is a very different question. And we have people, we have Muslims in the world today who are extremely literalist in their interpretation of the text. So it wasn't 20 years ago that we had one of the leading literalist scholars giving a, a, a official ruling to say the earth is flat. Because it doesn't matter what your science says, my reading of the Quran tells me that the earth is flat. 
So you've got extreme literalism at one end. Do not use your reason. Your reason will lead you astray. And at the other end, you have got people who are extremely rationalist in their thinking. Because the Quran says again and again, I gave you reason so that you could ponder things out. Think about these things. Knock your head on it until it makes sense. So therefore, reason becomes a very important part, first of all, of the interpretation of the Quran, but secondly, how you're going to put it into practice. Now, there's a, a lovely example from the early period. Muhammad wants to send somebody down to the Yemen to guide the community down there. And he calls the man that he wants to send. And he said, I've got a job for you. One or two questions first. How will you guide the people of the Yemen? According to the book of God, he says. Well done, says Muhammad. Nice answer. I like it. And when that runs out? According to your wise example, O messenger of God. Well done, says Muhammad. Getting up the class here. And when that runs out? Well, the man says, well, I use me common sense, of course. Well done, says Muhammad, you've got the job. In other words, you've got three levels of guidance. First and foremost, you have the guidance of the Quran. But the Quran has to be interpreted. Now, if you get a chance, you might be able to have a squint through the windows into the library here, and you will see there's a huge room stacked with books, which contain a tiny number of commentaries on the Quran. A tiny number, you know, because there are thousands of commentaries on the Quran, written over 1600 years in all different languages, by different people from different philosophical systems. Some of them are majoring on history, some on linguistics, some on tradition, some on law, some on mysticism, some on philosophy. And they have very different interpretations of the Quran. It's the same book, exactly the same text, different interpretations. That's only our first step. And then you have got the life and teaching of Muhammad. How does he put it into practice? Now, we have got two different collections of the life and teaching of Muhammad. These are collected in reports. These reports we call hadith. So, amongst the Sunni community, you have got six major collections of hadith. The two major ones, the first one contains less than 9,000 hadith, 8,900 and some odd, by a man called Bukhari. Bukhari travels the Muslim world for decades in search of reports of the teaching of Muhammad. And he says that he has gathered 600,000 of these reports. And he sifts them and he checks them and he says, who told who told who? Does it make sense? Does it fit in with the teaching of the Quran? Is that man a liar? Did that woman ever exist? Did they live in the same place? And he checks them and checks them and checks them. And he goes from 600,000 down to less than 9,000. From this, then, we can assume that there's a whole pile of stuff in that early period which is less than fully authentic. Some of it may be pretty close. Some of it may be good. We don't know. But if you go from 600,000 down to 9,000, by definition, you're saying there's a whole pile of stuff there that's being rejected. Now, in the Shia tradition, they have a different system. Because Sunni and Shia are differing about the character of the people who were alive at the time of Muhammad and immediately after his death. Now, some of those people from the Shia perspective, distorted the teaching of God and the teaching of the Prophet. Now, if you will distort something as fundamental as that, 
why should we believe you when you tell us how the prophet used to drink his tea? You know, in other words, you're examining the character of those transmitters and you're saying we need to be very careful about the character of those transmitters. If one of the transmitters is somebody who was prepared fundamentally to distort the teaching of God and the prophet, how can we say that that's a suitable person to pass on this teaching? So you can see you've got two different systems in play there. Now in addition, in the Shia tradition, you have got these infallible successors to Muhammad, the Imams. Now, if I am infallible and I say to you, Muhammad said this, end of conversation. So you have a totally different level of authority coming in. So on the one case, you've got A told B told C told, and you're trying to check it out. And on the other case, you've got an infallible person who was saying, that's what the prophet said. So you can see you've two different systems. But the crucial thing is that on your second resource then, the teaching of Muhammad, you have vast diversity. Now, if you didn't have vast diversity, you wouldn't have difference within the community. That's your primary source, the Quran. Your secondary source, the life and teaching of Muhammad. Your third source is your nut, reason. Now, if we think about it, not all human beings are equally endowed with the gift of reason. Some of us are cleverer than others. Some of us are quite prepared to spend a lifetime in research and study and thinking and pondering, and other people want to grow potatoes. That's their job. So that not everybody is on the same level when it comes to reason. Therefore, we have, you know, the reason of scholars, we can say, whose job it is to do a whole pile of the thinking for us. But at the end of the day, if a scholar cannot make that teaching comprehensible, understandable to ordinary people, well, then you're a pretty rotten teacher. You know, we have people who think that you write books full of big words that nobody can understand. I have no respect for that at all. Because if you truly know and understand and penetrate something and want to teach it to others, you will learn how to teach it in a way that people can understand. Otherwise, you are disrespecting the student. Yes, sir? Yeah, yeah. The three things that you mentioned, you know, Quran, Hadith, uh, uh, use, uh, person should use his or her own intellect. Yeah. And there's a fourth one, which is Ijma. Yeah. Ijma is the consensus of the scholars, religious yes. scholars. The difficulty is, you know, we say that if you've got four scholars in the room, you have five different opinions. Mm -hmm. So, yes, lovely, we would like to come to a consensus. Tell me when we get there. That's the problem. Now again, you see, because you have some schools of Islam that give much more place to the use of reason, they find it much more difficult to come to consensus because reason is always expanding. Our human intellects expand. We know more now, thank goodness, than we knew 500 years ago or 5,000 years ago. Those who are more literalist, they find it easier to come to consensus because they're using vastly less reason. So yes, consensus is very helpful. Now, of course, you can have consensus on small things and they can be very, very important. For example, you know we have people in the world today who think that Islam permits you to go around slaughtering people, permits you to drive people from their homes, permits you to enslave women, to use women as sex slaves, to break up marriages and so on, because that's what they've seen ISIL doing. Now, who is to say this is not acceptable in Islam? Well, one scholar might say it, 
But if another scholar comes along and says, what he said is right, I'll countersign it. And then 20 more come along and say, what those two said is right, we'll countersign it. You've now got 22 scholars. That's heavier than one. Now you're working towards your consensus, your ijma. And when you go from 22 to 222, or to 2022, you get stronger and stronger and stronger in your teaching. So ijma is something toward which we're working, not necessarily something that we are easily going to find. Now, the way I see it, I mean, most of the scholars, they agree with lots of things. Yep. There are a few disagreements, okay, which we can, for the time being, ignore them, and then go to the majority of the things that they believe. Yep. Which we, the, as Muslims, we can follow and practice. Yep. So, yes, I mean, you have lots of agreement on lots of things. And again, you see, um, after coffee, we'll, we'll look at some of these divisions. Now, you can have divisions within uh, the Islamic tradition. Everybody knows, oh, we have Sunnis and we have Shias, for example. But you have a huge amount of overlap, a huge amount of things that we both agree on. So just because we come from different traditions doesn't mean that we disagree on everything. We disagree on some things, otherwise it wouldn't be different. Um, so seeking consensus is a very important part of human life and of scholarship. Achieving consensus is another thing. That's something to which we strive. Can I just ask, with yep. scholars, can they be male or female? Yep. They are human beings. As long as you're a human being, you're on. Um, and we know that right the way back from the earliest period, that you have Muslim women who were fundamental in passing on the teaching of Muhammad. You have Muslim women who were great experts in hadith, in these traditions of Muhammad, in giving wise counsel to the men, in law. So scholarship is open to anybody. The problem is a three-letter word, M-E-N. <laughs> hmm? And what happens then is that men want to get that power into their own hands. Now, the easiest way to control women is to keep them ignorant. Yeah. So if I do not tell you, if I do not give you access to the books, then you will come to me and you will ask me, what do the books say? And so you've got, this has happened again and again in human history, deny women access to scholarship, deny them access to learning, that way you get to control them. And for me it is obvious in all religious traditions, the rich use religion to oppress the poor. The powerful use religion to oppress the powerless. And men use religion to oppress women. Now you can see why it's so important, the age in which we're living. And indeed, in the country in which we're living. Because from the very first moment, boys and girls are getting access to education they are getting access to the tools of scholarship and therefore a completely new insight into the tradition is being generated by women who for generations have not been able to access it. Look at what's happened, if you like, in Christian theology. You could say no Christian woman had access to the tools of theological scholarship in Europe before about 1960. It was closed book. That was men's job. That was men's world. When you start opening up and you start admitting women to the theological faculties, you start to get all sorts of new insights being created by believing women in that situation. The same is happening in Islam. And of course, what happens is that the young women are tooling themselves up to actually engage in this. And so when you get a grey beard, you know, 
who's saying, you know, this is what Islam says. You know, the young woman will say, show me, show me what it says it. Here's the book, show me. He can't read the book. Huh? His grandma told him this was true, but she can read the book. She knows. And therefore, you've got a whole new um, depth of scholarship that's coming about. So no reason at all why a woman cannot be a scholar, open to anybody. Yes, sir. Because um, in Christianity, we had a history where there was resistance to translating the Bible into, yep. um, you know, the vernacular yep. languages. And I mean, w was that the case with Islam? Was there a, a resistance to sort of translating from Arabic into other languages yep. in order to safeguard scholarship and keep it in the hands of the select few of Well, a, even more than that, let's go right back to the lips of Muhammad. Okay. Muhammad does not write down the Quran. There is a community of people around him who memorize the verses of the Quran as he recites them. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are memorizing something, you're getting it in through your ear. Therefore, you know the pronunciation, you know the phraseology, you know, as it were, where the emphases come. Now, that gives you a richer grasp of that material than the boys were writing it down. So there's another group over here, they could read and write. And they're writing down from the lips of Muhammad. But they're writing down on scraps of paper and skin and leaves and stones and bones and anything else they can find. Some of them have good spelling, some of them have good handwriting, some of them have good grammar, some of them don't. So they're writing as best they can. Now, you've got two deposits from the lips of Muhammad. The most authentic deposit is in the hearts of the memorizers. Then what you do is that, and this happens within 15 years of the death of Muhammad. Exactly when? Not terribly sure, but certainly by uh, 647, 15 years after his death. Somebody comes into town with a whole big manuscript book. And what you do is you get the best of the scribes and they sit down with the book and they draw together the memorizers and those who have got their own written editions and they cross-check and then they write the best possible master copy of the Quran. It's still the best possible written copy because at this stage we don't have all the grammatical niceties. You know, we don't have the vowels. We don't have, you know, the punctuation and so on. So you're still reliant on the memorizers. And even when we copy that master text in Arabic, because we want to send a copy to Iran, because they're asking for one, so we send them a written copy, but we send some of the memorizers with it so that they can explain any question about how to pronounce this, how to phrase it, ask the memorizers. So there would be a tradition in Islam that says the Quran only exists in the hearts of the memorizers. You know, written down, it's like an aid memoir. Now, of course, it's been written down over centuries in Arabic. Over those centuries, grammatical niceties have come in, vowels, punctuation, etc. So you've been able to write the Quran more accurately. Now you've got chapters and verses so you know where you're going more accurately and you're all the time cross-checking with the memorizers. But your Quran is now only the Quran in Arabic. As soon as you translate something, it's an interpretation. You know, if you take Shakespeare, and you put it into German, even if you're a great German poet, you haven't got Shakespeare anymore. You've got an interpretation. Now, there are 33, at least, English translations of the Quran available today. And they vary differently, because you've got different human beings choosing and selecting which words to use to translate. You know, if you if you go along and you hear the Bible being read somewhere, you say, I've never heard that before. Well, of course you have. It's just a different translation, 
makes it sound very different. So the translation, Arabic text of the Quran, English translations, French, German translations, whatever, just in the same way, you will never get two Christian New Testament scholars to have a conversation about an English translation of the Quran. They always want to go back to the Greek text. So you will never get two Muslim scholars to have a conversation about the content of the Quran based on an English translation. You always want to go back to the Arabic text. So you've got the problems with translation there. You've got the authenticity of the Arabic text from which everybody is working. You've got two more things on top of that. One is that if only 15% of Muslims worldwide are Arabic mother tongue, 85% of Muslims either have to learn Arabic to be able to read the Quran or they have to rely on a translation. And the vast majority are relying on translations. We can't do without them. But it, I mean, with, in Christianity, people were actually executed for trying to they were. Yep. translate the Bible into English. I mean, did that happen in the early... No, time? no, no, no. I mean, the first translation that we know of is probably 1132, uh -huh. when it's translated into Latin. Oh, right, right. That happens in Spain, in Toledo. Richard of Ketton, mm. and that, that probably is the first. We don't know if there was an earlier translation, for example, into Persian, mm. because, you know, Islam reaches Persia in 650, but as far as I know, I've not seen anything, because in Muslim hands, the Quran is in Arabic, mm. um, but it was into Latin so that Western people could read it. Uh, That's interesting. Remember that the, the whole Christian problem about translating the Bible was not about the translation, it was about the loss of power. Oh, yeah, no. I yeah? That, yeah. yeah? <laughs> if only I understand it, because only I have the language, I control you. Yeah. And as soon as I put it out in a language that you all understand, you're going to form your own opinion. You're going to say, wait a minute, it doesn't say that, Governor. It doesn't say, give me that money. It says, you know, whoa, come on, it does. Yeah, go on. <laughs> So it's all about power. Power, money, all these things go hand in hand. Yes, sir. I'm oh. sorry, um, just going back, yeah? could you just repeat about um, where you mentioned um, how religions use, uh, maybe how men would use religion to suppress women, but then you also mentioned how the rich use religion or to control and how, I think there's a second part. Men use religion to oppress or to control women. The rich use religion to oppress the poor, and the powerful use religion to oppress the powerless. I mean, if you think, I mean, the whole caste system in India is based on preserving the power of the powerful classes. So if you can say to somebody, you know, there, there, you are born into a very low caste, if you're a good boy and you're low caste and you do all the work I ask you to do and you don't make any complaint, next time you'll be born into a higher caste. This is control mechanism. If I say to you, you know, you have a tough life now, it's true, you know. But don't worry, in heaven you will have a lovely life. Yeah? This is the rich using religion, the powerful using religion to oppress the poor. I, I worked for a while in West Africa in a, with a development group there, and in the office there was a big sign. It said, Islam is for this life, not just for the hereafter. Yeah? It's about improving the lot of human beings in this life, not just what happens after death. That's what I mean by, you know, using religion to oppress the poor. Um, you know, God loves you, and God will give you a nice reward in heaven, but just now you keep slaving away from me. Or the saying that if somebody does something well, you know, their time will come in the hereafter. Yeah. Let, let it be now. Yeah. And that's the danger, you that's see. Because at the same time, you see, we can't, we can't be God. 
So we do have a tradition that says God reward, will reward you in the way that God knows best, either in this life or in the hereafter, both in this life and in the hereafter, so that we're not merchants. You know, there's that very famous saying, which I like very much, from Imam Ali. Now, Ali is the, the cousin of Muhammad, who becomes his son-in-law, and for the Shia, he is the first Imam, the successor to Muhammad. Okay, and he says, some people worship God out of the fear of hell. That is the worship of slaves. Some people worship God out of the hope of the reward of paradise. That is the worship of merchants. Dear God, I did this, you owe me that. And some people worship God out of pure love for God alone. That is the worship of the servants of God. So the motive for human action is love of God. Whether God will reward me or not, that's God's business. How God will reward me, that's God's business. My business, out of pure love for God alone, is to act with justice. You know, when the Quran talks about, obviously some people have been saying to Muhammad, oh, you know, tell us about the people of hell. You know, who's in hell? Huh? And the Quran answers. It says, they ask you about the people of hell. I'll tell you who are the people of hell. They are the people who deny the rights of the widow and who swallow up the property of the orphans. Those are the people of hell. So justice. You do justice because of the love of God, the love of humanity, because it's just. Reward, God's business. Please. What you've just said reminded me of something I read about Cyrus the Great, who was the king of uh, Persia. Yeah. 2,500 years ago. And he said that I wish I had enough water to get rid of hell, fire of hell. And I wish I had enough fire to burn heaven. <laughs> and then people will only love God for themselves. That's, see, that's exactly that point. It's not about reward. It's not about being merchants. And of course, a lot of us act like merchants, you know. Dear God, you owe it to me because she did awful sins and I didn't. No, no, it's not like that. Yeah? Actions are determined by our intentions. Our intentions are to love, worship, serve and obey God. So four things go to together in Muslim understanding. The Quran says, why did I create human beings? I created you for no other reason than that you should worship God. If you are going to worship God, then you will obey God. You will obey God's commandments. You will observe God's prohibitions. That's forbidden. Don't do it. Thirdly, you are to serve. Firstly, you are to serve God. Very good. Secondly, you are to serve yourself. Why is alcohol forbidden? Because it screws up the human body. Yeah? Smoking, taking these, these medicines, these food, these drugs, whatever it might be. Of course, the ultimate lack of service to yourself is to kill yourself. That's why suicide has always been forbidden. It's in the Quran. I am to serve myself. I'm to serve my family. Now, um, my family have responsible, you know, they have demands on me. I cannot say that I will not look after them. That's my responsibility. Well, even when it comes to inheritance, you know, some of us would like to say, I'm going to leave all my money to my two daughters. I had a son, but he was a real swine. He never came to visit me. He never did anything. Why should I leave him anything? And Islam would say, no, no, there's justice. Still your son, still your son still gets a share in your inheritance. You have to serve your family. When I marry, I take on responsibilities to my wife's family. She takes on responsibilities to my family. So to serve myself, to serve my family, to serve the community in which I live, to serve the society in which I live. 
um, Islam is not a system of personal piety. I'm ever such a pious person, go in the corner and do my prayers all the time. No, that's not enough. You know, there's a lovely story about um, back to the time of the Prophet. Somebody comes running, Sir, you're most welcome. Somebody comes running along and says to him, Come down to see this guy. This guy is the most pious person I know. So the Prophet goes down to see this guy. And, uh, and he says to him, I, I hear you're a very pious person. Oh, I am, he said. Spend all my time in prayer. Very good, says Muhammad. And who feeds you and who feeds your family? Well, my brother does. You know, uh, he looks after them, so I can spend all my time in prayer. And Muhammad says, then he's much more pious than you are, aren't you? Because he's doing his duty. He's tending his family, not neglecting them. So this business of serving family then becomes hugely important. And then the fourth principle is the principle of love. All human actions are to be done because of the love of God. So worship, obedience, service, love. These four go together. Yes, sir. Yeah, what I wanted to say, I mean, what you, you mentioned, I mean, I believe with you about male dominance. Yes. Okay? That uh, you don't educate the women. Yes, sir. Okay. But someone could argue that uh, there was a division of labor. You know, women had to perform certain tasks, and men had to perform certain tasks. A man is supposed, a uh, husband is supposed to look after the wife, so he has to go and earn and bring money at home. And the wife is supposed to cook and look after the children and nourish them and all that. Okay? No. I'm just saying that uh, somebody could argue that. They could? But, yes. But the way I see it, even if you look at, at the rulers, even the Muslim rulers, they made sure that the public were uneducated because if they're educated, they will ask for their rights democracy and all that, you know, they, they will question the rulers what they are doing. Yeah. But if they are ignorant or make them, you know, busy with the basic necessities of life, like looking, uh, searching for food or water and all that, they will not think about, you know, challenging the ruler. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the way that you use religion to oppress poor people within society. Um, it, it's important to say, I mean, you're quite right, there are certain responsibilities that fall to women because men aren't very good at having babies. <laughs> huh? But after you've had it, don't forget, you have the right to ask your husband to supply a wet nurse to feed it. And if you should agree to feed your own child, you're saving him money. <laughs> hmm? uh, and it is his responsibility to ensure that hot food is placed in front of his wife at least once every day, either by his own hand or by the hand of a servant or by the hand of McDonald's. <laughs> so again, we need to get back and see what Islam is actually teaching and not how have the men, you know, <coughs> selected from the story so that they make sure they come out on top. Uh, even, you know, when the Quran says that a woman will guard the man's properties and, and honor and so on. Why? Because it's a responsibility she owes to God, not to him. And likewise, he owes a responsibility to her, to guard her honor and her dignity and so on. So we mustn't uh, think that women are created to worship men. They're created to worship God and only God. And from that flow things, you know, if I'm worshipping God, I'm not going to be running down other people within society. I'm going to be protecting the dignity of the family and so on. If you go back to those five questions that we had at the beginning, um, one that we need just to look at before we move on is the question, what is Islam? And what I've done here is to try to formulate the answer in one sentence. That's why I've written it on a bit of paper. Islam is the way of life 
founded upon the final, universal, divinely protected revelation of the perennial guidance given by God on how to live a fully human life in a balanced creation and advance towards life with God, sent to the final, sinless, infallible prophet who perfectly put it into practice and established a protected pathway to lead to paradise. Now, just have a look at that for a second, and then we'll see whether we agree or disagree or we have other ways of looking at it. Could you pass that one along, please? <laughs> I can't move anymore because I'm now unmuted. <laughs> Right. Any comments on that sentence? Any disagreement? That's not right. All those great students who are sitting around here. What do you mean by this must be a, a, a rebel who preceded by the perfect life that he's talking about precedes the coming of the prophet. Uh, so this really describes end of human humanity right from the beginning as he should be and, and the prophet gave the revelation mm -hmm. but you see um, there are 124,000 prophets mm -hmm. each one of them receives that guidance on how to live a fully human life in a balanced creation and to advance towards life with God. That chain of prophecy comes to an end with Muhammad, but he is not outside that chain, he is the last in that chain. And the, you very well prick up on the protected pathway, because you remember earlier we saw that other revelations have been sent and stuff has happened to them. Bits have gone missing, bits have been changed, bits have been added, etc. Therefore, we do not have a perfect deposit of what was sent down to the earlier prophets. We do have that in terms of the Quran. Therefore, the Quran is that protected pathway, the final revelation which is protected by God. And if you're a Sunni, then you have the saying of the prophet that says, I leave after me two most precious things, the Quran and my Sunnah. And if you are a Shia, then you have, I leave after me two most precious things, the Quran and the Akhlal Bayt, the family of the prophet. That's the protected bit. Because if you take that within Shia terms, the, the saying of the Prophet goes on to say, I leave after me two most precious things, the Quran and my family. Never will they separate until they reach me at the fountain in the Garden of Paradise. Now, there's your protected path, you see. If you think about two tracks on a railway line. If the two tracks separate, the train doesn't run anymore. And if only one track is present, the train doesn't move at all. So that's your protected pathway. That's why I tried to express that in that phrase. Excuse me, the mm. term sunna, you mentioned earlier about hadith. Yes. Could you explain yeah. the difference? The relationship. The two? Yes. The Sunnah is the customary practice of Muhammad. Everything that he said, he taught, he did, and the things of which he approved, those become the Sunnah. Now, the Sunnah is reported in the Hadith. 
So a hadith is a report of an element of the sunnah. Okay, so that's, one is the, as it were, the report or the expression of the other. Yes, sir? Sorry, uh, just coming back on what you said about uh, how there were two different hadiths. Yeah. Actually, even in Sunni Islam, you'll really only find the one where it says uh, the Quran and the Sunnah in the tertiary books of hadith. So Ibn Manzur, etc. The one that's actually narrated in Sahih Muslim is the one that the Shia also take, yeah. which is... Uh, the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt. So to say that the Sunnis believe in one and the Shias believe in one, actually, in the primary sources of Hadith, both of them are the same. But the way that it's interpreted within the Sunni tradition mm -hmm. is, different. is different. And that's the point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's right. I mean, and like all these things, it's all a question of interpretation. Uh, there is one Quran. As far as the Shia con are concerned, the Quran very clearly says X. Now, all Sunnis will agree the Quran says that, but they give it a very different meaning. It's always a question of interpretation. It's not that we have two different Qurans. Um, we do have some hadith that are explicitly from one tradition and not found in the other, but we have a huge amount that's in both. But then it's a question of interpretation. Anybody else want to come back on that little definition? Yep. Yes? Have I not said a fully human life in a balanced creation? That's the way I've tried to express this Deen al-Fitri, you see? The natural way of life will be another way of putting it. But the point is that it's fully human and it's within a balanced creation. So that makes it natural, as it were. Yes, sir? Yeah, you mentioned about the interpretation, different interpretations, mm. the Sunni and the Shia are, are, are doing it. I don't know. I don't think there was Shia Sunni during the time of the prophets. I don't know where, when did the Shia Sunni had emerged. The other thing is that if there are two different interpretations, both of them cannot be right. One has to be right, the other one has to be false. Perhaps, let's unpack it a bit more first before we, we get there. Um, are we happy to move on? Great. Let's look then, now we're going to our fourth question about the divisions within Islam. And um, again, this is another area in which uh, we have a huge amount of, of misunderstanding. Because some people will talk about the division between Sunni and Shia as though it was, you know, the red-shirted football team versus the blue-shirted football team. And you support whichever team you want. This is totally to misunderstand. The question is, there is a verse in the Quran that says, when God and his messenger have decided upon a thing, the faithful man or woman has no choice but to obey. So it's not a question of which team do I support. It is a question of what has God and his messenger laid down. I have no option but to obey. Now, it hinges around the question, first of all, of who should be the successor after Muhammad. If you are a Sunni, you will say, God and his messenger were silent on this question. They did not lay down who should succeed Muhammad after his death. The Quran is silent, the Prophet is silent, 
therefore it's up to the community to sort it out amongst ourselves. I am being obedient to God and his messenger. I am not putting my interpretation on what God and his messenger have said. If you are a, a Shia, you answer that question in a totally different way. Because if you are a Shia, you will say, God has laid down who should be the successor to Muhammad. Where? In the Quran. What? A different Quran? No, the same Quran. So there is a verse in the Quran that says that the, the Wali, I translate Wali as the guardian with authority. The guardian with authority of the community is God, everybody agrees, the prophet, everybody agrees, and then the one who gives in charity while continuing to bow in prayer. That's where the question comes in. To whom does that respond? To, to whom does that relate? Now, for Shia scholars, it's clear then that this related to an episode in which there was a beggar who came into the mosque at a time of um, voluntary prayers and was going around looking for alms. He comes to Ali, who is in prayer. He is bowing in prayer. He holds out his hand and indicates the ring on his finger to give the ring to the beggar, the one who gives in charity whilst continuing to bow in prayer. Then the Shia scholars will say, Muhammad was asked, what is the meaning of this verse? Does it relate to what just we saw with Ali? Yes, it does. Therefore, from a Shia perspective, God has spoken that Ali is the one designated by God, Nas, designated by God, to be the successor to Muhammad. God has spoken. Secondly, there is another verse in the Quran that tells us Muhammad does not speak by his own volition, but only by the will of God. In other words, when he says something, it is the will of God that he is expressing. Therefore, we take just two examples. One from the beginning of the story, that after the first revelation has come, Muhammad is told, you are to summon your family, you are to tell them that you have been called to be a prophet and, as it were, to recruit them to the cause. This is before anything else is done, after the first revelation. Muhammad assembles his family, he declares that he has been called by God to be a prophet and he says, who will follow me? And they all take several steps backwards except for one young man. And this young man is Ali, and Ali is probably 12, 13 years of age, that sort of age, and he steps forward and he says, I will be that one. And Muhammad says to him, you will be my brother, you will be my successor, my friend, and the executor of my will. Muhammad speaks not out of his own will, but only by the will of God. Therefore, here we have Muhammad speaking under divine command, you will be my brother, my friend, my successor, the executor of my will. Therefore, as far as Shia are concerned, from the very beginning of the story, Ali, you're most welcome, sir, come right in. From the very beginning, sorry, you're most welcome to, <laughs> I was in mid-sentence before. Um, from the very beginning of the story then, oh, there you are. Come higher, friend, as we say. From the very beginning then of the story, Ali knows 
that he is to be the successor of Muhammad. Therefore, he is watching, observing, taking in, imbibing the, the way of the Prophet, the Sunnah. And now we go to the very end of the story, and right at the very end of the Prophet's life, a few months before he dies, he goes to make the Hajj, the pilgrimage. Now, everybody in the community knows he is elderly, he is weakening, he may not be here next year for the Hajj. Therefore, a huge gathering of people go to make the Hajj with him. We can say this is probably the largest gathering of Muslims that he ever saw in his lifetime. Okay, they do the pilgrimage. After the pilgrimage, they're on their way back to Medina, and they come to an oasis. Angel Gabriel comes to Muhammad and says, you are to proclaim, convey to the people that without which it is as though you have done nothing. Now, see where we are in the story. You've had 22 years of the revelation of the Quran. You've had the Prophet perfectly putting it into practice. All the Quran has been revealed. All the uh, instructions on how to live a Muslim way of life have been conveyed. All the principal practices have been done. What can it be? Convey to the people that without which it is as though you have done nothing. So then we have to observe what happens. Muhammad now calls together the assembly. Those who've gone on ahead call them to come back. So assembles them all together. The largest assembly of Muslims that he ever sees in his lifetime, I suggest. He then raises up onto a high place where he can be seen and heard. He calls Ali to come to him. He raises his hand and he says, all those of you who accept me to be your maula, your master, your teacher, your leader, accept Ali as your maula after me. Now, from a Sunni point of view, from a Shia point of view rather, you've got from the beginning of the story to the end of the story, Muhammad reinforcing Ali is to be his successor. Therefore, that's the end of the discussion. When God and his messenger have decided upon a thing, the faithful man or woman has no choice but to obey. Now, the Sunni, of course, will say, yes, those incidents took place, but the Shia are over-egging the pudding. Yeah, you are interpreting this, you're putting your interpretation into events. Who knows? So before this last example, that Khadikhum, for example, Ali had been leading a, a raiding party down to Yemen, you know, a military, and it had gone badly wrong. And the other lads were ganging up on Ali. And all that Muhammad was doing, saying, you know, Ali's a good lad, lay off him. He's a good man. So you are over-egging the pudding. You are reading too much into it. So the crucial thing is that you've got two interpretations, one event, one divine command, when God and his messenger decide upon something. Now, if you are a Sunni, you interpret things one way. If you are a Shia, you interpret things another way. But in both cases, it's in obedience to the divine command. It is not red shirts versus blue shirts. Yes, sir. Yeah, I agree with whatever you have said. But if you look historically, I mean, all the people believed, Shia and Sunni, that Imam Ali was the most educated and most wise. The other thing is that Imam Ali did not care about being a ruler. He, what he cared most was that Islam is properly taught and practiced. So whenever those who were in power became caliphs, they got it wrong, Imam Ali corrected them, and they accepted it. 
So this is the mission of Mamali. Okay. Uh, what the Sunnis will say is that Ali was still a young man when Muhammad died and leadership really goes to the graybeards. So, you know, we need to wait until he has matured and is old enough to become the leader of the community. And there were other people who corrected the early caliphs. You remember the, the famous story of Umar, Caliph Umar. Umar declares that from this time onwards, the wedding gift, the mahr, which is given from the man to the woman could only be this amount of money, small amount. And one of the women in the community jumps up and says, what, stop, you can't do that. He says, well, what do you mean I can't do it? I'm the caliph, sit down, shut up, woman. Nah. She says, no, you can't do that. Because you cannot undo what God and his messenger have permitted. And Umar has to put his tail between his legs and sit down and say, she's right. God and his messenger permitted it. I cannot change it. So correcting, now, I mean, Abu Bakr, we're told, stands up and says to the people, I, you know, follow me in all those things which are in accordance with the Quran and the teaching of the Prophet and correct me anything which is not. So, yes, Ali acts as this corrective, but it's not his exclusive preserve as far as the Sunnis are concerned. Go on, you're going to be sheer again now, aren't you? I have to play the Sunni here. <laughs> the way I would interpret it is that when a woman can correct, at that time they were not that much educated, when a woman can correct a, a, a caliph, and caliph accepted that yes, he was wrong, because he was trying to change what uh, the, the, the prophet did or said, that shows how much educated they were, where they fit, to become a ruler when they did not know the Sharia? This is a question. The answer to this question is very simple. Allahu Allah. <laughs> God knows best. Huh? Uh -huh. I mean, but you can see the, the issue. Now, it's important that we, we don't trivialize this thing. You know? it's, it's two communities who are trying to bear faithful witness. Now, the story goes on because there is another episode related in the Quran. And we're told that the Prophet is there with a, a cloak or a blanket around him, a wrap around him, and he successively calls under this wrap his daughter Fatima, Ali, her husband, and their two sons, Hassan and Hussein. We've now got five under the blanket. And then the verse of the Quran is revealed, O people of the household of the Prophet, people under the blanket, I desire to purify you with the most thorough purification that you may be the purest of humankind. Now, the Shia interpretation of this event is to say that all leadership must come from that family because that is the family that have been purified. And therefore, you have a blood element. Muhammad, daughter, Fatima, husband, Ali, sons, Hassan, Hussein, all future Imams must be descended from the marriage of Ali and Fatima. Now, you expand on that, you know, in Shia, understanding and so on, but that's the principle then of saying that all leadership in the community, the imams of the community, now the word imam here does not mean the local man or woman who leads the prayers. The word imam is used in a very specific Shia context here, and it means the divinely appointed, sinless, infallible, inspired, spiritual and political guardian of the community. 
even if you do not have political power, and some imams did not, nevertheless they are entitled to it. Not because they are extremely learned, not because they are extremely pious. They may have been very pious, they may have been very learned, that's not what it rests on. It rests on the divine appointment. Therefore, if I'm speaking about the Shia Imams, I always use the phrase, the divinely appointed Imams. That clarifies what we're talking about. So, you know, if you just use the word Imam, you could mean anything at all. But we're talking about the divinely appointed Imams. Now, it's not who's got the best hairdo, you know? It's not who is the most knowledgeable, who is the most pious, whatever, whatever. It doesn't rest on human authority. It rests on divine authority. Muhammad appoints Ali. Ali appoints Hassan. Hassan appoints Hussein. And so it goes down the track. Each imam is sinless and therefore infallible. Therefore, when they speak and they designate my successor, God has spoken. Next question. Yes, sir. Yeah, there's this issue of Mubahela. I'm sure you yes. know about it. Yes, yes. Can you please elaborate uh, for those? Yep. Who don't know? There is an incident, and if you read the third chapter of the Quran about the first 80 verses, we're told that these verses were revealed at the time that a Christian delegation came from a place called Najran. Najran is in modern day Yemen. And they came mob-handed to the court of the Prophet in Medina, their princes, their bishops, and their judges. And they had a serious discussion, a serious confrontation with Muhammad about the person of Jesus. The first thing to say is, although there's this serious confrontation about the person of Jesus, Muhammad allows the Christian delegation to pray in his mosque in Medina. Ibn Ishaq, if you want to look it up. Now, you know, if you're a Satan worshipper and you come and say to me, well, it's, it's cold and wet under the trees, can we come and use your church or use your hall? You might say no. Hmm? The fact that the Prophet allows them to offer their Christian prayers in his mosque on an occasion when there's this big discussion about, he's saying, you've misunderstood the person of Jesus, lads. But they're still, the object of the worship is still God. That's the crucial point. The object, or as we say, the referent. You are worshipping God even though you've screwed up your understanding of Jesus, he is saying. Didn't quite say screwed up, but that's a translation. Now, it gets to a standoff, and the agreement is that there will be mutual cursing. In other words, we will invoke the curse of God upon whoever is lying. Do you remember, you know, the prophets of Baal, Cain, uh, Carmel, and all that stuff? You know, invoke the prophet, invoke the curse of God on whoever is lying. And you are to come with your women and your children. Now, the next morning, the Christian delegation see Muhammad is coming out and he is coming with Fatima, his daughter. He is coming with Hassan and Hussein, now, technically his grandchildren, his children, and with Ali. And Ali is called the, the nafs, the, the essence, the self, uh, the soul, if you like, of Muhammad. So now you've got these five again, the same five who were under the blanket. And they are coming out for this challenge of mutual cursing. Now the Christians have said to themselves, if Muhammad is prepared to risk not only his own life, but the whole family, under the curse of God, you know, may God smoke me down if I tell a lie. Let's back off here, lads. 
because if he is a prophet, you don't want to mess with the prophet and we're not willing to take a chance on it. So the Christians were told back off and this mutual cursing does not take place. But again, it's especially from the Shia perspective, it is the reinforcing of the five under the blanket, the Akhl al-Bayt, as the most purified of all creation. Yes, sir? Then why nowadays Christian and the Jews are not allowed in this place, you know? That's because, that's because men are not as pious as the Prophet. Uh, yeah. Here's the, question again. the question is, if that's the case, why is it that Christians and Jews aren't allowed into Muslim places of worship today? And my answer is because human beings are not as pious as the prophet is. Do you know, I could take you, you all know this, I could take you to mosques here in this city where they will look you straight in the face and tell you women should never come to the mosque. And my answer to that is, so Muhammad wasn't a Muslim. Because for 10 years in Medina, five prayers every day, men and women pray together in his mosque and he leads them in one congregation. Now, you could well say, if it's good enough for the Prophet, why isn't it good enough for you, Maulana Saab? <laughs> huh? It's because your beard is too long or too short or any, you know, but this is really important. If it's good enough for the Prophet, why isn't it good enough for us? And you're perfectly right that um, people are not as pious as the Prophet. I want to know why it was banned which year? Oh. No. Now you have to ask a bigger boy than me, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm not that clever. Um, partly, you see, if you go back to if you go back to the year 629, now this is the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And what happens is that Muhammad has a vision that he is going to make the pilgrimage. He's going to go to Mecca. Now, the Muslims are banned from Mecca. They're up in Medina. Okay, there's daggers drawn between the two communities. And he says to his community, who of you will come with me? I'm going to make a visitation to Mecca. And they go, a few hundred of them, without arms. Do you know just the kind of knife that you use for eating your food, this kind of stuff? And outside Mecca, they are met by a delegation, the leaders of Mecca, at a place called Hudaybiyah. And in this meeting, Muhammad gives way to all their demands. He agrees we won't go to Mecca this year. He agrees, you know, that you don't need to call me prophet of God. We'll write a treaty. You just call me Muhammad ibn Abdullah, the son of my father, etc. And, and, and. And the agreement then is that next year for the Hajj, you Meccans will evacuate for three days. And then we Muslims can come just for three days, we make our pilgrimage, and then we go. Why evacuate? Because we do not want you ridiculing us at the, heart, at the depth, the heart of our religious practice. So this is the first, um, we can say the first uh, haram created around the city of Mecca, only during these three days. Now that then gets extended to only during the five days of Hajj later on. Then it gets extended over history to include the city of Mecca all the time, and then the city of the Prophet, Medina, all the time. So what we have today is Mecca and Medina as two haram cities. Only Muslims are allowed in. Now, that's a historical development. You know that there are some, shall we say, rather extreme people on the Sunni wing who would regard that prohibition as applying to the whole of the Arabian Peninsula. If that's not so as far as the Saudi rulers are concerned. Because after all, you've got to make money somehow. And you've got to have servants. 
So, you know, you can have Christian servants, all these poor Filipino women who are working there, and, you know, um, Bengali men and Nepalese men and so on and so forth, not in Mecca and Medina. Unless the heating system breaks down. Huh? <laughs> and then, you know, we want our heating system replaced. So it's a problem. Please. Yep. First of all, infallibility is only part of the story. The story is sinlessness. So again, I would translate the Arabic term masum as sinless, or technically impeccable, without sin. Now, if you are without sin, you are by definition also infallible. But you could in theory be infallible that is not erring in your teaching, and you could be a sinner. So that's the first thing. They are sinless and therefore infallible. So translate masum as sinless or impeccable. Secondly, you're perfectly right that if they cannot sin, then they're no use to me at all. Because I can and I do. Sometimes. Okay? Only sometimes. Um, Therefore, they must have the capacity to sin because the capacity to sin is part of the human dignity of free will. Angels do not have the capacity to sin. They do not have free will. Why does God create human beings with a capacity to sin and to rebel? Contrast. We have at home a washing machine. We throw the clothes in, we set it going, it washes the clothes. I never feel the need to get down and give it a big kiss and say, thank you, washing machine. It's not chosen to do anything, it was programmed to do it. It's like an angel. God has as many angels as God wants in heaven, permanently worshipping God. Whoopee, they were programmed to do it. Second example, washing machine breaks down. Washing builds up all week. I know that my wife has had a really difficult week, so have I. Saturday morning, I get up early before she wakes up. I get downstairs and start going through the pile of washing by hand. I have done an action that no washing machine is capable of doing. I have done a free act based on love based on altruism, based on compassion, and you can see the quality of that act is totally different to the act of the washing machine. So God has as many angels as God wants permanently worshipping God because they're programmed to do it. What God wants is the worship of a free being because the quality of a free act is totally different. Therefore, Part of our human dignity is freedom. Freedom means that we are free to obey and we are free to rebel. Therefore, prophets and imams must have the capacity to sin. They do not sin. How? Well, different people will give you different answers. Some will simply say the hand of God rests upon the prophet and therefore the prophet is prevented from sinning. Others will say to know the consequences of sin means that you would want to avoid it. You know, how often do we say to our children, if only you knew how much that hurt me, you wouldn't have said it. You know? To know the consequences means that you wouldn't do it. So therefore the prophets have that degree of knowledge which means that they do not sin. And another way some scholars have talked about it is to say that you know the prophets are as it were, they are totally purified through the flooding of divine light. 
So light is a purification. And they talk then of the light of prophecy, the light of the indwelling, the nur Muhammadi, as we say in, in Arabic. Hmm? And then, of course, in the Shia tradition, we will talk about, and, and the light divides, you know, and one is passed down through the tradition of the prophets and so on, and one is passed down through the imams, and of course, both coalesce in the womb of Fatima. So Fatima is one of the 14 masum, 14 sinless ones. She is not a prophet, she is not an imam. There's a little thesis that you can write up. The importance of Fatima as the female masum. And I think that you begin to understand that when you think of what takes place in her womb. That is, that through the womb of Fatima, you have the uniting of two streams. The stream through the blood of Muhammad and the stream through the sperm of Ali. There are the children, Hassan and Hussein. So that's the way that I think we would deal with it. Now, again, very, very important that we remember, you know, get two Muslims, three opinions. You will find huge difference amongst Muslims on the question of the sinlessness of the Prophet. There are those Muslims who say the Prophets never sin in any way from the moment of their birth to the moment of their death. Amen. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have those who will say Prophets do sin and their repentance is an example to us. But nobody says that a Prophet sins in anything that touches upon the prophetic mission. Now, and you've got every step in between, you know, those who say you may sin in minor ways but not in major ways, and those who say, well, you may sin in your early life but not after the call to prophethood. Very many different steps. If you are on this end of the spectrum and you say a prophet never sins in any way, amen, and you hear these people talking about the prophet as a sinner, how dare you speak disrespectfully of my beloved prophet? You're not fit to be called a Muslim, you're not. And if you're at this end of the spectrum, and you listen to these guys who are saying, prophets never sin from birth to death, oh yeah, where'd you get that from? You know? Where, where'd you get that from? So you can see huge difference then, here. So again, Difference is the name of the game. Yes, sir. On the question of uh, prophet uh, repentance, repentance doesn't mean that they were sinning. Repentance uh, goes to prove that they would have wished or wanted to do more than they did. Mm. And that's the mm. way it's, it's, it's supposed mm. to be understood. So that the human being, by virtue of being human, even though most pure, most perfect, etc., um, it's still not living the life of paradise. If only, you know, then you could do even more. That sort of idea. Yeah? Yeah? We've got 10 minutes before we break for lunch. Um, in terms of talking about divisions and differences, we could talk about, you know, four different schools of law amongst Sunni Muslims. Uh, we could talk about Salafis and Sufis and such like. Um, we could talk about differences within the Shia tradition, those who follow a line of 12 Imams and those who follow a line that goes off at seven or goes off at five, etc. And we haven't even talked about the main similarities and differences yet. Uh, so maybe we won't even go there. What do you want to do in the last 10 minutes, please? Mm -hmm. Salafis and Sufis? I've just got a suggestion. Yes. Why not? I mean, because you've got a lot of area to, to cover and we don't know. We, we need knowledge. So why not tell a similar gathering some other time? Whereby you can all this. You must talk to the Begum. Okay? 
She who must be obeyed will decide on these things. So should we discuss on the rise of Salafism? Yes. And the main um, thinkers of this movement. Because Ooh. I understand that it's a new, it's a current, it's a quite modern phenomenon, isn't it? So. Well, it depends. Um, we have the Hadith of the Prophet in the Sunni collections that says, the best of generations is my generation. The second best generation is the generation of my companions. And the third best generation is the generation of the successors of my companions. Now these three generations are called the Salaf. Hence Salaf, Salafi. Now, if you belong to those Sunni schools of Islam, then the golden age of Islam is the age of the Prophet and of the Salaf and of the followers. Therefore, every uh, renewal movement points backwards to the golden age of the Salaf. That's why you find people will say, we are going to revive Islam, we're going to renew Islam, by going back to the purity of the early generation. Now in that sense then, the Salaf, the Salafi, are not new at all. They are, you know, returning to the old purity. Now, one of the things that they say is that within the first two, three hundred years, you get the founding of the schools of law, the, the different mafhab, and uh, even these are uh, moving away from the pure generation because you are using your reason. See, um, and again, uh, the Malachi school uses less reason. The Hanafi school uses the most reason amongst the Sunni schools. So the more reason you use, the more you're likely to be departing from the purity of the earliest traditions. Therefore, what the Salafi are saying is, throw out, go back behind these four schools of law, go back to the purity of the earliest generation. Yes, sir? What would you say is the main difference between Salafism and Wahhabism? Coming. Okay. So Wahhabism much later on the scene. Okay. Um, now, one of the branches, one of the ways in which the Salafi tradition sees itself in the world today are called the Ahl Hadith, the people of the Hadith. So, <clears throat> this is particularly on the Indian subcontinent. Now, the Ahl Hadith, Green Lane Mosque, if you go down to Small Heath, they are saying, Quran and Hadith Understand it literally, interpret it exactly what it says, because God and his messenger know better than you do. God and his messenger know better than your reason. So cut the reason out of the game. If it says it in the Quran, if it says it in the Hadith, end of conversation, do it. Now that's a kind of Salafi model. Go back to the purity of that early generation. That's why you will, you will find um, men walking around with their trouser legs up above their ankles because we're told that the Prophet used to shorten his clothing so as it didn't drag in the mud, of course. But that's not the point. He shortened, the point is, he shortened his clothing. Yeah? Uno? And your prayers will not be accepted unless your ankle bones are visible. And we know on one occasion there's a hadith that says that the Prophet and his companions prayed with their shoes on. Therefore, we can do that too. So you can pray with your shoes on. Not all the time, but sometimes. So you're constantly going back, and if you can find a tradition, that's acceptable, that's allowable. And if you can't find a tradition, that's an accretion. You've added that on through your use of reason. Therefore, you shouldn't trim your beard. You shouldn't comb your beard out and make it look really rather swish. 
No. It should be a great big bushy job like this, huh? because this is what the prophet had. So you can see then, now, again, you need to understand the thinking behind it. The purest generation is the generation of the prophet. Therefore, we should be like the prophet. Yes, sir? There were not, sir. You're quite correct. Therefore, that's the product of your shaving machine. Therefore, that's the product of your reason. That's what's led you astray. Now, Salafis and Wahhabis. Salafis are a much wider grouping. And we must never think that there's only one grouping amongst the Salafis. There are some Salafis who would be extremely um, non-violent, pacifist, we can say, in their interpretation of Islam, who are extremely pious and who are interested in piety, not in power, not in force. You are accountable to your life, I am accountable to God. Um, and who will want to keep out of politics. Then there are others who will say that the use of force is part of the practice of the prophet and the early companions, therefore it's also acceptable for us. And then at the extreme end of that tradition, they will say it's not that it's acceptable, it's a necessity. So if you are a Muslim, then the armed jihad of legitimate force is a necessary part. And that's where you get those who drift off into what we would today call military extremism. Okay? Now, coming out of that tradition, but not the same, are the Wahhabis. The smallest of the four Sunni schools of Islam are the Hanbali. The Hanbali are located in Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula. Not just Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula. Not all of it, but it's, that's where it's located. They use least reason in their argumentation. They are the most literalist in their interpretation. Reason deviates from the truth. Now, into this school, this, this Hanbali school, is born Muhammad ibn al-Wahhab. Dies in 1792. Not too sure when he was born, more interested when he dies. 1792. And what he says is, again, the old cry, we must purify our Islam, by going back to the early practices and stripping away all the accretions. Now, he said there is shrine worship going on. Destroy the shrines. That will stop it. There is nature worship going on. People are going to sacred springs and sacred trees. Cut them down. That will stop it. So you're going to purify your Islam in a pretty belligerent way. And he spends his life, please, I mean, it's also about individual piety, but do they go to the extent that it's Wahhabis also? Some would, others wouldn't. Okay. Some will say, my job is to follow the purity of the way myself. By this you will have an example. If you want to follow these strange practices, you're accountable to God. Right. Okay. So you can be a very pietist, withdrawn uh, uh, in the Salafi tradition but not in the Wahhabi tradition. Now, remember that, you know, one of those strange quirks of history, the Wahhabis, who are a religious movement, link up with the Saudis, that is the house of Ibn Saud, and this is the political grouping. Now, this is a Bedouin clan leader, and the two join forces. So one supplies the muscle, the other supplies the vision, as it were. And this then is the start of that politicization of the Wahhabi tradition. Now, first of all, you will know that 
before the days of the Wahhabi, having such a grasp of the holy cities of Mecca and Medina, all schools of Islam had their centers of learning in Mecca, Medina. All different schools were there. Um, everybody would go uh, to pray at the tomb of the Prophet. Everybody would go to the great cemetery of Al-Baqi and so on. Now, what the Wahhabis do is that they purify their Islam by getting rid of these things systematically. Now, we know that one of the great tensions with the Shia school of Islam is that uh, Muhammad ibn Wahhab dies in 1792. Six years later, in 1804, there's a major Wahhabi assault on Karbala, in which there is destruction, in which the shrine is destroyed, is broken down, in which we're told, however the accurate the counting is, that there are 400 camels needed to carry the goods and treasure back to the Arabian desert. Now, so you can see that Wahhabi Shia tension goes right the way back to the time of Ibn Wahhab and his immediate followers. Once the Saudis, as a political force, get power, and for this, like many things in the world, you have to blame the British. Hmm? Yeah? Because you remember that First World War, um, the Ottoman Empire, which rules the Arabian Peninsula at this time, joins forces with the Germans, they lose. The British and the French carve up the territory between them. And because, you know, perfidious Albion, you remember, you can never trust the blighters, we promise three ways. We promise to the, to the Hashemites, you rise up, throw out the Turks, and you shall have self-determination in the Arabian Peninsula. And we promise to the Saudis, you know, you shall have the two holy cities of Mecca and Medina provided you keep pumping us the oil. And then, of course, we promise to the European Zionists that we are disposed to see the creation of the state of Israel in the land of Palestine. So it's this time then that the Wahhabis really get power. That's why in 1925, one of the things they do is to destroy the shrines of al-Baqi, including the shrines of the imams who were buried there. There are four imams buried in al-Baqi. Any advance on four? Yes, four. I get a nod. There are four imams, and there was a beautiful shrine to them, destroyed, 1925. If you go there now, sand, a bit of a stone. That's it, all you get. So you can see these kind of tensions are there all the way through. Yes, sir. How did Sufi, um, the, um, <clears throat> I think my first exposure to Islam was when I went to see a film called Khartoum, you know, back in 1966. And the Mahdi, I mean, how does, does he fit into that? Yep. He, he, he tried to purify Islam, didn't he? And that was about 1883. Is that the there is, all, in all schools of Islam, the understanding of a figure called the Mahdi. The Mahdi, we can say the awaited one, the, um, the messianic figure, if you like. And he will, uh, will arrive in the end times of the world, will purify the world from, uh, from injustice and from uh, unrighteousness, and will usher in a time of peace and uprightness and justice. The Sunnis will say, the Mahdi has not yet been born. We don't know his identity. The Shia will say, the Mahdi is the 12th Imam, who in 941 goes into complete hiding, occultation. And since 941 is alive upon the earth, but hidden from our sight. So the model that's given is the sun. No, on a cloudy day, the sun is hidden behind the clouds, but you know the sun is still there, and you see the benefit of the sun. You feel its warmth and light, etc. That's the twelfth Imam. He is hidden from our sight, but is still alive. Therefore, he is the Imam of the present age. 
he will re-emerge into sight as the Mahdi, and he will then be called Imam al-Mahdi. Now, because you've got in both schools this real tradition of the age of renewal, the age of revival, the messianic age, if you want to stomp up a good fight amongst Muslims, you proclaim yourself to be the Mahdi. Rise up, arm yourselves, follow me, I'm the Mahdi sent by God. That's the Mahdi of Sudan. So he launches a kind of rebellion against the British, and he does quite well. Remember General Gordon? Yeah. Gordon of Khartoum kills him, this big heroic death, etc. Unfortunately, the British don't like that kind of thing, so they send Lord Kitchener. Now, it takes Kitchener seven years to get his army down to Khartoum because he's building a railway. And on this railway, he's taking Maxim guns, you know, m machine guns. So that when he actually gets to Khartoum and the Mahdi and his boys come out to fight, they are armed with spears and shields and clubs, and he is armed with Maxim guns. And so by 11 o'clock in the morning, the fight is over, and you've got dead followers of the Mahdi everywhere. Therefore, he wasn't the Mahdi. Because if he was the Mahdi, he wouldn't lose. So you get this again and again in history, you want to storm up a good rebellion, you know, Theresa May might be trying this tomorrow, I think. You know, I am the Mahdi, yeah? Follow me into Brexit lobbies, yeah? And you will find then that people will follow her. So was he the Sunni or the... Uh, he was Sunni. He was Sunni, yeah. Yeah, the thing that you missed out is that uh, Almighty will appear with Jesus. Yes. Mm. Jesus is also coming back, and they're going to, they're going to team wrestle, okay? Now... Which way the team goes depends if you're a Sunni or a Shia. Because as far as the Shia are concerned, Jesus is the co-worker of Imam al-Mahdi. And as far as the Sunni are concerned, the Mahdi will be the precursor, the one who comes before Jesus, who's, as it were, softening up the enemy before he comes in. Yes, sir? Sorry, I'm going away because my, somebody rang me, my uncle is dying in Peterborough. Oh, my word. And they're uh, having a funeral, but I came late also, I'm sorry about it. Sir, you will, you will take our blessings with you, and, and we will pray for your uncle Thank also. You. Thank you very much. Friends, we ought to take that as our, as our um, tip that we should break. Uh, those who don't know the building, there is the chapel at the far end of this corridor. You are very welcome to make your zuhur, your zuhur and asr, to do whatever you want there. If you want to pray in Jamaat there, you're very welcome to do so. You just have to choose somebody who's pious and wise amongst you to lead. Eh? <laughs> that, that rules out one or two people. Okay, now, um, food is in here. Um, we'll hear it in a bit. Rakaya, tell us about food. Uh, it's in the dining room. So everyone right. Is it hot or cold? Uh, it's sandwiches. It's sandwiches. So you can pray first and you can eat second. Or... You can eat first in order to work up the strength for prayer. <laughs> but whatever you do, back here at 2 o'clock, please. Before you end the ministry, just a minute. Yes. Good precious time. Are you aware about the founding father of Pakistan, Muhammad Iqbal? Yes. His view is no more Mahdi, no more Jesus coming back. Are you aware about that? Yes, because he saw, he, he wanted to interpret things differently in a political way with, um, with the story of Pakistan. And he also wanted to move from a top-down authority structure to a bottom-up authority structure. So he went, for example, from the ijma of the ulama to the ijma of the whole community. That is, we're not looking just for a consensus amongst the scholars, but we're looking for a consensus amongst the people. And that, of course, is the root of Pakistani democracy. You know? And one day it will happen. Inshallah. But so far we've not had any Pakistani democracy. Huh? <laughs> but one day it will happen. When the gentleman said founder of Pakistan... Yes. 
I didn't catch the name. Was he talking about Jinnah? Because we see. Ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> there are two different people here. <laughs> Muhammad Ali Jinnah is called the Qadi Azam. He is the, the founder or uh, the father of the community. Now, he is the one who brings about the political reality of Pakistan. So he um, takes on Gandhi and Nehru and so on. Gandhi wants to maintain united India. Nehru says, you know, we must, we must have a, a Hindu majority here and therefore you can have a Muslim majority in Pakistan. So he becomes the political father of Pakistan. And he lived to see less than a year of it. Now, the other man is Muhammad Iqbal. Muhammad Iqbal is one of the great 20th century poets of North India. And he is a poet who has studied philosophy in Europe. He writes a doctoral thesis in Munich on the philosophy of Nietzsche. And he is credited as being, as it were, the spiritual founder of Pakistan. He provides the vision. He provides the, the, the goal of having this society. But from day one onwards, there's been this tension with Pakistan. Is Pakistan created to be a homeland for the Muslims of the Indian subcontinent? Or is Pakistan created to be an Islamic state? Now, sometimes um, Jinnah speaks as though it doesn't matter whether you're Hindu or Christian or Buddhist or Sikh or Muslim, you're all welcome. You can go to your temple and to your church and to your good water. You're all welcome in Pakistan. And at other times, he's talking about it very much as an Islamic state in which other people are tolerated. That's where the difference comes in. But they're two different characters. One is the political operative. I think it would be fair to say not a man who exemplified the deepest of piety in his own private life. That was Muhammad Ali Jinnah but a huge political figure. Um, Muhammad Iqbal is the great philosophical poet who, as it were, dreams up the idea and provides the, the vision behind it. And was his vision a homeland for Muslims or an Islamic state? Or is some, I don't a... think we could simplify it enough to yeah. say. Yeah. He dies in 1938. Um, it's important to remember that there were more Muslims that remained in India than ever were in Pakistan and that it was only a few years ago, literally less than 10 years, that the balance tips over that there are now more Muslims in Pakistan than there are in India. So the idea of India as a Hindu state, which is the BGP today, the Hindufta terminology, this has never been true. This was never the vision, either of Gandhi or of Nehru, Patel, any of these guys. This is a new d development, and it's part of the, uh, the confessionalization. You know, you've got your Muslim state, we want a Hindu state. You don't belong here. That's incredibly dangerous. You know, remember that I mean, more than a million were massacred in the Punjab alone with the division of India. Uh, and bloody massacre. I mean, it, it's 80 some odd days. It's less than three months. Really nasty. Um, I've heard recently, very, very briefly, um, that with what's happening uh, in India at the, at the present time, um, a lot of um, history there, maybe from the Mughal uh, Empire, where buildings were made and had the, the Muslim or Islamic historical names are now being changed into a Hindu state. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, the, the prime example of that is Allahabad. Right. Allahabad has is, is now had its name changed. Right. Because obviously, Allahabad 
huh? the, the, the place of Allah, the, the settlement of Allah, this is obviously coming from the Muslim period. It's now being changed uh, into a Hindu name. Um, buildings, places, shrines, uh, names of places, history is being rewritten. Because the people who are doing it have got political power. You know, I mean, it's Mr. Modi and his BJP who have political power and they are doing it. I mean, other Indian politicians, broadly speaking, Congress party, we can say, would not be in favor of that. But there is real political tension going on at the moment in India. And it is this confessionalization. This is the Hindu state. And the corollary of that is, if you're not a Hindu, you don't belong. And so Muslims, Sikhs, well, you just say, well, all Sikhs are really Hindus. All Buddhists are really Hindus. Um, you know, it, it, it's the Christians and the Muslims that we have most problem with. Jains, they're Hindus, really. So it, that's the difficulty.